Hi everyone, today I will be going over loops, and this is a continuation from our previous lesson on for loops and while loops, except for today's lesson I will be going um, into nested loops and some other built-in functions for loops. So on our agenda we have, of course, please I'm going to replit so you can code along with me, and then I will be going over a quick review of um, the loops we went over in our previous lesson, and then I'll go into nested loops, enumerations, um, some loop keywords, and finally I'll end with a demo. Now to start, here's a quick review of the loops we went over in the previous lesson. So for for loops, you have two options of what you can do with these. You can do for variable name in a certain range from one index to um, another index. And then you could also do for a variable name in a sequence such as a list or a string, things like that. And then for while loops, you could um, check for a certain condition. And while that condition is true, this chunk of code below it will continue to run. Now, what is an iteration? An iteration is essentially a sequence of repetitions that generate new outcomes. So for example, in your while loop, uh, for every time you run that um, code underneath your while loop, if the condition is still true, then it will repeat, it will um, have another repetition of the while loop code. And then that repetition in itself is what you would consider an iteration. Okay, now for the range function, this is a built-in function where you would put for the first parameter the start index, and then the second parameter you would input the stop index and the stop index is always exclusive so if you had if you inputted a range from say 0 to 3 what would print out is 0 1 and 2 rather than 0 1 2 and 3 and that is again because the stop value is exclusive so what are the differences between immutable and mutable data types immutable data types um, cannot be changed in place. So for example, tuples and strings, you would not be able to change the original tuple or string. And if you attempted to, it would give you an error in your interpreter, or you could create a new tuple or string and from that, um, you would already make those changes. Now for mutable data types, these values can be changed in place. And some examples are lists and dictionaries. Um, so for list and dictionaries, you can change those values with there. There are built in um, list and dictionary functions that will allow you to change those values without having to create any new lists or dictionaries. Moving on to indexing in Python, the index of the first element is always a zero and then it will increment by one for each value in your uh, list. And the index of the last element can be written as negative one and from there you can also index in reverse. So now to get into our actual lesson for today, nested loops are essentially loops that are within another loop. And I'll show you an example of that. All right, so for this demo, we have a two-dimensional list. And what a two-dimensional list is, is that um, it is a list, but for each value within the list, there is another list. And this could also be called a 2D array, or in this case, a multi-array. So for this first chunk of code, um, this runs for each row in the multi-array, it will print out the row. So for each of these values here, for each row, it will be printed out in the interpreter, like so. Okay, now for the second chunk of code, for each of these rows in the multi-array, um, then for each column or for each value, it will also be printed when you run it, like so. So each, each value in the entire multi-array will be printed here. So you can also use a nested for loop to access each of the elements in the list. And you could do this by, um, so for, for each of these rows in the multi-array, you would be incrementing by one for each 
uh, iteration. And then you would also have this for loop here for each of these numbers within row. You would be checking if the number is equal to five. And so for our first row, none of the number is equal to five. So it will exit this for loop, go back and run the second iteration of our parent um, for loop. And it will move on to the second row and checks whether one of these numbers is equal to five. And since one of them is equal to five, this here will run and will print, I found five in row number two since this incremented twice and then it will continue to run through the entire multi-array until it leaves the nested for loop and then it will print out the total number of rows in the multi-array and that will be equal to five you see here i found five in row number two and number of rows is five and you can also use a while loop, a nested while loop, to print out all of these values here. And so what this chunk of code does is that while row num is greater than zero, we declare a variable row to be equal to the multi-array at index row num minus one. And we would use row num minus one since um, again indexing in python always starts at zero so if you were to do row num by itself multi-array at index um, of just row num by itself that would be at index five and there would be no index of five in this list so it would go back to the beginning and print this out but so what you want to print is our row five and this would be index four. So that would be five minus one, four. So row equals multi-array at index four. And then we also declare the variable array length to equal the length of um, this row. So that would be equal to three. And then while array length is greater than zero, we want to print out row at array length minus one because again, indexing starts at zero. And what this would print out is the index of row at index two. So it would print out 15 because this is at index two for this list here. And then every time this while loop runs, array length will keep decreasing by one. So as it continues to go on, it will print 15 and then 14 and then 13. And then, so once it reaches 13, this will be at index zero. So the array length would be less than zero. So it will exit this while loop here, and then it will decrease row num by one, and then we would move on to our second iteration for the while loop, and it would continue to print out the rest of these values here. And you can see that it prints out all the values um, in reverse. All right, so moving on to some extra examples. So for this first example, um, imagine you have two arrays, array one and array two. So for our first array, for each value in that array, you will be um, running through all of the values in array two. And you'll keep doing that for every single value in array one. And then for the second example, for each value in our first array, while n is greater than 10, you will execute this code here and it is assumed that at some point you are decreasing n so that this does not end up as a infinite loop. And for this third example, it is similar to our first example where for each value in our first array, all of the values in our second array will be run through except while n plus m is less than three, this will actually um, execute your code. So it is also assumed that either n or m is being incremented somewhere in this code here so that your code does not end up being an infinite loop. Okay, so moving on to enumerations. Um, here we have the enumerate function, which for its first parameter takes in the list that you want to enumerate uh, with, and the second parameter takes in the uh, index that you want 
to start at for your um, tuple, which I'll go over in a second. And then the enumerate function returns an iterator of tuples that contain, for the first value, will be the index of the value in your list. And the second value will be the actual value within your list. And the enumerate function is really good to allow you to track both the index and element of your list. So here is an example. Uh, if you were to print this, array2 is equal to doc at bird, and then you print the list enumerating through array2, and this returns three uh, separate tuples. And so dog will be the value of the array and then it will be at index zero and the same for cat and bird but say you wanted to start at a different index then you could do star equals two and this will start your index at two and then will increment by one from there here this shows how you can use a for loop to um, make it look a lot nicer you could do the value at dog at the value dog at um, what index it is at and here this index here shows the actual index of the value in your array um, rather this is just where you want to start at so this is usually would be starting at index zero. Um, you don't necessarily need to include that as a parameter. It is the default parameter. And so basically for the index, it replaces this value as index and then it replaces this value as val in um, this enumerated array. And then it does, it runs this code here. And it does the same thing with our second example. So again, it enumerates through our array three, and then it prints out these tuples, each with the value and its corresponding index. And it runs through this with the for loop here to make it look a lot prettier. All right, so now let's move on to some keywords for loops. First, we have break, which exits the current loop. Then we also have continue that does almost the same as break except it continues to the next iteration instead of um, exiting the current loop and pass is not very commonly used in programming for python and what it does is it basically doesn't do anything so i will show you guys an example of this okay so here we have two infinite while loops and this while loop here is nested in the outer while loop. So when you run this, it prompts the user to input either continue, pass, or exit. So if you were to input continue, it would run the continue keyword. And what this does is it doesn't run anything below it, um, but it doesn't necessarily exit out. It will continue on to the next iteration. So from here, you can do pass as well. What pass will do is it just passes through this conditional here and continues on to the end of the while loop here and will print that you are still being stuck in a loop. And then it will continue to the next iteration. Now, if you wanted to exit the loop, you would type in exit. And from here, you would run the break the break keyword here and then you wouldn't run anything here you would completely exit out of the, the nested while loop and then you would be you would still be in an infinite while loop except you would be in the outer um, while loop so from here if you want to exit from this outer while loop as well you all you would have to do is break from it again which you could do by typing exit and then you are outside of both loops all right, so now I will be going into looping um, and how Python is run on runtime. So 
Uh, sometimes your program can be a lot slower than if you were using another language and this is because of time complexity and how long it takes to run your program based on um, how many loops you have. So the more loops you have, the longer it will take your program to run. And I will show you guys an example of this here. So here in this demo, um, We've declared a with a list here, and then for this first for loop here, um, for each value in A, we are incrementing the count by one, and then we are printing the number of iterations, like so. Okay, so what this code basically shows you is that it has a runtime of O of N. That's what we're trying to show you guys. Um, since this for loop depends on growth linearly so basically the more data you input into this for loop the longer it will take to run it and the time is directly proportional to the amount of data you inputted into this for loop here okay now for this second example for each value in um, the range of the length of this list so range four so 0 to 4, or actually it would be 0 to 3, since, again, the stop index is always exclusive, so it would be from 0 to 3. And then for j in range 0 to um, length a is 4, minus the first value of i would be 0, so 4 minus 0 minus 1 would be 3. So from 0 to 3, or 0 to 2 count would increment by one and this is a lot easier to show if we just print out i j and count every time this is run okay so as we can see the um, value of i starts at zero and then the value of j also starts at zero and then count increments by one and then again this will run again i is still equal to zero j is equal to one and then count increments to two and then this keeps going until it reaches the end of the range so once it reaches two it will then exit this for loop go back to the outer for loop here and then it will run again where i is equal to one and then this will affect the range here because as i is increasing um then the range here will continue to decrease and this will actually decrease faster than I will um, reach the end of the range here. Okay, so when this is equal to one, the length of a four minus one, minus one would be two, so the range would be from zero to two or zero to one because again, the stop index is exclusive. And so you can see that here, zero to one, it keeps incrementing and then we reach the third iteration at two. This would be zero to one, this would run one time. And then for the fourth and final iteration, this I would be equal to three. So this would be from range zero and then four minus three is one, one minus one is zero. So from zero to zero, there are no values between zero and zero since these, the stop index does not include zero. So this would not run um, for the final time. And then after that has been run, we print out the number of comparisons in this bubble sort, which is six. So now let's move on to our second example. And this code here demonstrates again how um, the more data input you put for your for loop or the more um, loops within your nested loop, then this is directly proportional to how long it will take for your code to run. And if I go just into more specifics about this code here, this line import num numpy as np, this imports the numpy uh, library, which allows Python to support really large arrays. And then here we are declaring the variable large matrix to equal this really, really large array. 
And then initialize count to zero. So for each row in this matrix, um, you will print adding. And there are 200 rows in our matrix, so we will print adding 200 times. So for each column in each of the rows here, uh, so for so each column that would be 200 columns within each row since here you can see that 200 by 200 by 200 so from those 200 columns for i in range of length of column that would be the range would be from 0 to 199 since 200 is exclusive and then each time that happens count will be incremented by one and then the total number of elements should be printed so the total number of elements within your entire array will be printed and that will come out to um, 200 times 200 times 200 which is 8 million and let's just run our code here all right so you can see um, it printed adding 200 times for the 200 rows here and then the total number of elements is, as I said before, 8 million. Okay, so let's get into our 5 under 5 segment. Um, let's skip the first question for now since this has to do with dictionaries and we haven't gotten to that yet. For question 2, um, what is the output of this code? I will give you guys a second to think about this. Okay, so what would output is an error since tuples are immutable data types and cannot be changed. So if you were trying to change um, the tuple at index 0 to equal 100, you would come out with an error since tuples cannot be changed in place. Okay, question 3. Why would you want to use a while loop instead of a for loop? And again, I'll give you guys a few seconds to think about this. Okay. So for loops are counting loops. They are used when you are trying to run through a sequence um, or a range, anything like that. And they are exit controlled since you know when that sequence or range um will end so once you reach the end of that sequence then you will exit from the for loop as for while loops these are conditional loops so the while loop will continue to run as long as the conditional is true and once the conditional is false then that is when you will break out from the loop and that is why it is an entry controlled loop so we would use a while loop when we aren't sure when the end condition will be false Sorry, showed the answer there, but for question four, how many comparisons will this code perform? And um, if we just look at the answer here. So the first line for num in array, this will loop 100 times since here we are making a list of 100 zeros. So there will be 100 uh, values inside of array for each of these. So that would make um, 100 times 100 times 100 equal to 1 million. So the comparison will happen 1 million times. Moving on to question five, out of these following variable names, which one is valid? So if we take a look at this. For days times rent, this is not a valid variable name since no special characters are accepted except for things like underscores or dollar signs and you cannot use the asterisk symbol within a variable name. Now for the second one, for this is a valid variable name since Python is case sensitive and you didn't use um, the reserved keyword for which would be used for for loops since you did capitalize the F in for. Price one is also valid since the underscore is used, which is valid, and the number is used after all the letters. It does not start with a number. However, for this one, the number um, does start at the beginning of your variable name, so it is no longer valid. 
my city. This is not valid because there is a space right here and spaces are not acceptable in variable names. While this is not a valid variable name because you are using the reserved keyword for while loops. Let's get into our demo. So here we have um, this code right here is very similar to a bash show, which takes in um, user commands, basically. So if we run this, it prompts the user to input something after this hashtag symbol. And so whatever is inputted here will be stored in command. And then we declare the variable args to be equal to um, command.split. So what this does is you insert two words, then this uh, function here will split that string into two separate strings and will store that in a list under args. So if the length of args is equal to one, so if there's only one word, and if um, you type in pwd, then it will print this is online. Who knows that? And then if you were to print, I mean, if you were to type in who am I, it will print out this username here, jz0024. And then if you were to type in exit, it would break from the loop and then print out exiting totally not back shell. Now for this second part here, um, this is for two words. So if you um, inputted two words, here then it would run this conditional here so if you put switch user this would not do anything but if you did switch user to Rachel and then you go back to our first conditional here and then you input who am I it will respond back with Rachel now, if I were to put something like CD and then Rachel, it would respond back, this is online. And then we can just exit again, like so. And that is our Bash Shell demo. Now we're at our challenge problems. So for our first challenge problem, we have to create a list of the first 100 perfect squares. So let's declare a list called squares, an empty list. We created an empty list, and then we want to create a list of the first 100 perfect squares. So what we would do is we would create a for loop for, um, for number. For each number in the range 1 to 101, since 101 is um, exclusive, so this is technically 1 to 100, then what we can do is squares.append. So we're adding, we're adding values to um, the squares list. So then we're adding the value num squared. And then finally, we want to print our list. And it prints out all of the perfect squares from 1 to 100 here. OK, so for our second example, we want to return a list of only words that begin with vowels. So we take this list here. OK, and we can get rid of this. We have our first list, and then we also want to create our vowel string to be A, E, I, O, and U. So for name in names, for each name in this list here, we want to check if um, name at index zero is in um, our vowels string, and then we can print out name. And this prints out all the values with um, a 
vowel at the beginning of the string. Okay, next we have this challenge problem here where we want to, without using the subtract, multiply, or division operators, we want to implement subtract, multiply, and divide functions, and you can assume that a is divisible by b. So we want to um, subtract, multiply, and divide two numbers without actually using those corresponding operators. And I will do that. Okay, so let's start out by defining our subtracting function with parameters a and b. And don't worry too much about functions for right now. We will be going over them more in depth in a future lesson. Um, but for now, you can just focus on all the code that is within each of these functions. So we define the subtract function and then we initialize the count variable uh, to zero. And then we check for our condition um, while a is greater than b. And then we increment count by one each time and we are also incrementing b by one each time and then we return a count and then we call our function so we print out subtract with values 20 and 8. so this will print out 20 minus 8 is 12 and It'll be a lot easier to show you guys what is actually ho happening in this code if I just print out the values of count and b each time. All right, so as this while loop continues to iterate, it increments count by one each time and it also is incrementing b by one each time. And so it is only incrementing um, count until b is either equal to greater than or equal to a or 20. so once b reaches 20 then count no longer is incrementing and therefore you return with the subtracted value from 20 and 8 which is 12. okay now we can move on to the multiply function parameters a and b we again initialize count to zero and then for x in the range of a we want to also increment count by one sorry not one we want to increment um our count by b and then we can return count. So if we um, comment this out, and then we print the multiply function, um, two and five works. We get 10. And this is because for each value in our range of a, which is 2, so for each of those two values, we are increasing by 5. So that will give you 10, and that is um, a simplified version of multiplication right there. And now we can move on to our division function, where we can um, initialize count to 0. Then we would put while a doesn't equal zero. Uh, we will again be incrementing count by one. And then we can change the value of a to equal, um, go back to our subtract function here and subtract a and b from each other. So basically what this would do is that it continues to increment by one um, as it uh, iterates through here and then a is constantly being subtracted from so if we did print divide uh, 
12 and 2. No, you're up. We'd be subtracting 12 by 2. And we'll go through here. So that would be 10. Our new value of a would be 10. And then that would be 10 minus 2 again. So that would be 8. And it would continue to do that until a um, is equal to 0. And then it will finally return count. So when we run it, we get 6 as expected. Now for a final challenge, given this matrix here, print out the diagonal from top left to bottom right, and then do this again from top right to bottom left. So we can take this matrix here, okay, and then get rid of this, paste our matrix. Okay, so what we want to do is um, locate each value in the left diagonal. Let's start with the left diagonal. So four row in our matrix, but we want to find the length of our matrix. And then from there, we want to find the range of our matrix. So for each row in the range of the length of our matrix, we want to find the column or each of these individual values within the row in the range of the length of matrix at index zero, for example. Okay. Now, in order to um, figure out how what we want to compare here and to locate the left diagonal values, we have to find the pattern. So this value here is at row zero, column zero. And then five is at row one, column one. And nine is at row two, column two. So what you, what you will notice is that um, for each of these values, both the row and the column are um, equal to each other. So you can use a conditional to check if the row is equal to the column. And if it is, then you can print out the um, matrix at indexes of row and column. And this will print out 1, 5, and 9, which are the um, left diagonal. Now, if you want to find the values in the right diagonal, we would do basically the same thing. Matrix, column in this range, index zero. And here we again need to find the pattern of our right diagonal. So three is at row zero and column two. And then five is at row one, column one. And then seven is at row two, index zero. So what you can tell from that is that when you add those two values together, they are always equal to two. And two is um, one less than the length of the list here. So what you can do is if you add together row plus column and then if they equal the length of the matrix minus one, since again indexes always start at um, index zero, so you always put minus one for these cases then you can print the matrix at the indexes of each row from each column. Sorry, column. And it will run 3, 5, and 7. So that's it for our last example. Here are some other links that you guys can look over which I will add in the description below and you guys can check these out if you want to read further so 
that is all for today's lesson. I hope you guys learned a lot from it. And for our next lesson, we will be going over lists and list functions. Hope you guys enjoy that as well. Thanks for watching.